Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, our journey through pathology continues. Now we're going to start talking about glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is another important one. Uh, it is common, not as common as cataracts, which we talked about last time, and not as common as retinal and corneal problems, which we're going to talk about in the next ones. However, <clears throat> excuse me, glaucoma is a... Uh, condition that mo many, many patients get treated for, and it's not going to have as much as a significant impact as others on your daily interactions. But I still want you to know a lot about a glaucoma because A, it's very dangerous and it's something that needs to be monitored. Secondly, uh, or B, uh, I want you to be in the loop when it comes to people discussing their problems because we've talked about this a number of times. If you're going to be a professional and you're going to be dealing with patients, uh, it's important that you're in the loop. If the patient knows more about their condition than you do, which I mean, sometimes will happen. Some people are quite well educated on the things that affect them. However, for the you know most part, you should have a pretty functional understanding of all these conditions so that you can look the part and you can understand what people are discussing. You can understand the medications they're taking to affect or sort to effectively uh, treat these problems. And uh, there's nothing worse than not, you know, not appearing to be in the loop and people will, you know, lose faith in your credibility. So for that reason, let's talk glaucoma. We're not going to go into extreme detail, but I do want you to know a handful of important things about glaucoma that are going to make you well, essentially better at your job. So the first thing here before we start going to the fill in the blanks, we've got some images here and I want to go over briefly uh what it means to have a glaucoma now there are a couple different primary types of glaucoma for the most part we're going to talk about those two primary ones and i'm just picking a pen here so this is a schematic of open angle glaucoma so the first thing you have to understand is that when we talk about angle open angle and closed angle we're talking about the irritable corneal angle which is the interface in in the anterior chamber right in front of the iris here okay and that is where aqueous humor drains out through the trabecular meshwork and out the canal of oops sorry canal i got a little bit excited there canal of schlem c of s and that is part of your natural flow of aqueous humor aqueous humor gets produced just in here in the posterior chamber and by the ciliary processes it flows up through the posterior chamber through the pupil comes into the anterior chamber and drains out in that pathway we just talked about and this is what maintains iop intraocular pressure this is a very important system that is going on at all times inside the eye to maintain that intraocular pressure. Intraocular pressure is extremely important to regular eye health. Um, and in the first image here is the normal way that this takes place. With open angle glaucoma, the aqueous humor is still being produced, still flowing through the pupil. However, for some reason, the it is not draining out, okay? Now, this could be due to a number of reasons. Uh, you, you know, often trabecular meshwork uh, dysfunction is the main cause. However, this fluid is not draining out. So if you think about it, there's, you know, a continuous production of fluid, but it's not coming out. That is going to increase IOP. I'm having a hard time with the pen today. Increase IOP, and that could be very detrimental. You see here how the fluid is all kind of backed up. It's not coming out, and these arrows signify, let's try this again, increased IOP, and that could be very detrimental. This is open angle glaucoma. Now, closed angle glaucoma is when that angle gets squeezed off. Now, there's a couple of different mechanisms to that as well. It could be traumatic. One of the common ones is, uh, you know, later in life, <clears throat> the 
crystalline lens starts to opacify with cataract formation and whatnot, and then it starts to push forward on the iris and then blocks the pupil. We call that pupillary block. And then that creates something called a pressure gradient, which we're getting into a little bit of physics here. However, that pressure gradient almost sucks the iris forward and actually blocks off this angle. The mechanism to these things is not as important as what the overall effect is. But I do want you to remember this concept of open angle and closed angle, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more right now. So the most common type of glaucoma is the first one we're talking about, which is open angle glaucoma, which develops gradually over time and is asymptomatic. You know, people don't notice that this is happening. This type of glaucoma is associated with the dysfunction of the trabecular meshwork. Okay, things just aren't draining out the way they're supposed to be. Now, closed angle glaucoma can present itself suddenly because it's that closure of the angle. You know, one day it's closed, I'm sorry, one day it's open, the next day it's not, and that can be problematic. It can lead to extreme pain, blurred vision, redness, and nausea. Now, this type of glaucoma is associated with the sudden obstruction of the iridal corneal angle, or we just call it the angle. All right. Now, high intraocular pressure is usually the greatest risk factor for glaucoma. Now, one important thing that I have to mention, IOP does not necessarily equal glaucoma. OK, now they are very closely linked. Uh, however, it's not just because a person has elevated uh, IOP it does not necessarily mean they have glaucoma. They are at a tremendous risk for glaucoma. However, it is not one and the same. Now, measured values of tonometry, okay, uh, sorry, measured tonometry values. Tonometry is taking the pressure of the eye. Anything greater than 20 milligrams, uh, mil sorry, millimeters of mercury are usually considered high risk. Now, there are different factors. Uh, corneal thickness is something that, that plays into this. Uh, the ophthalmologist is going to take, you know, any any person who's a glaucoma suspect, meaning, you know, higher intraocular pressure and potential, potentially other signs of glaucoma, uh, they're going to go through a battery of tests to actually, you know, distinguish whether or not this person actually does have glaucoma or if maybe they uh, just happen to have a little bit higher than average uh, intraocular pressure. These are all things that are going to be examined. Now, the interesting thing here, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in the next slide, is that the concept of glaucoma is not necessarily the pressure itself, but rather the effect of having higher pressure. And that's the effect on the optic nerve and the tissues of the optic nerve. Uh, the primary concern with glaucoma is optic nerve atro atrophy sorry, from elevated intraocular pressure. As the pressure increases, something's got to give, and then cells of the optic nerve start to die off and atrophy. This is the bad news. So this is why uh, glaucoma is extremely important to monitor it, because as these cells are dying, the patient isn't feeling it. You know, it's, it's one of these things where this gradual increase in pressure will actually result in gradual nerve death and usually by the time that the symptoms are observed it's already too late okay now treatments for glaucoma include <clears throat> topical medications now these topical medications there's a number of them from beta blockers to other types of, of medications uh, usually in the form of eye drops they will do a couple of things they will either increase the outflow they'll help you know increase the amount of of uh, fluid being drained through the trabecular meshwork, or in a lot of cases, another concept is decrease the production of um, aqueous humor so that the pressure does not accumulate as quickly. Another common, uh, is, uh, sorry, procedure in this case is an iridotomy where uh, the, the ophthalmologist will use a laser to blast a hole through the iris and that will help flow uh, it will increase flow from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. This is often used as a uh, prophylactic measure as far as if the patient is starting to exhibit shallow angles, meaning that that angle looks like it could pinch off in the future. Um, this is going to be something that is going to aid in the potential ability to break that pressure gradient we talked about to prevent pupillary block and to let things flow a little bit more. Very, very commonly done, by the way, uh, as a preventative measure. There's also the iridectomy, which is kind of the um, two things. It's the preceptor to uh, iridotomy, 
basically before uh, we got good with lasers, the iridectomy was the preferred method of doing this, where it actually surgically cut a wedge out of the iris to achieve the same concept. This is still used if iridotomies just aren't working or if the laser isn't strong enough to blast through certain people's uh, irises. Some people's irises, especially really dark irises, can be very pigmented and very tough. So sometimes an iridectomy is the only option. I don't want to talk too much about how they choose these things because this is not my specialty. However, you know, knowing what I know, uh, these guys are not necessarily interchangeable, but they're used very similarly. Um, and then in you know extreme cases, a stent can actually be inserted. So basically they put a little tube that goes through the conjunctiva into the eye, goes into the anterior chamber, and actually will drain fluid out just onto the surface of the eye and that those little little droplets will basically join the tears and get drained out through the whole lacrimal apparatus and whatnot so these are common treatments for glaucoma so if people are talking about the medications they're using and you're going to start we're going to talk a little bit more about those medications so you can recognize them you will have an idea of which medications are being used for glaucoma and you're going to understand why they're using it if you see during a contact lens examination if you see a hole in the iris you will now know what that was used for now that doesn't mean the person don't don't go and say oh you have glaucoma remember iridotomies are often used as a preventative measure to avoid closed angle glaucoma. This does not mean this patient has glaucoma. It just means that the doctor thought it was suitable or, or a good idea to do this procedure to avoid any future problems. Same goes with iridectomy, though an iridectomy is a little bit more of an aggressive procedure. So usually it means the person was close to having trouble. And if you see a stent or if you have someone talking about a stent, you now understand why that is being used. So again, this is why this is important. You're not gonna be treating glaucoma. You're probably not even gonna be counseling glaucoma. However, you are now in the loop and you understand how these things are being treated. Cool? Now, um, glaucoma, for the, all the reasons we talked about, is often called the silent thief uh, because vision loss occurs gradually and without symptoms. Very, very important to remember this uh, because uh, actually it is one of the leading causes of blindness in the world because without preventative uh, measures, like we talked about the iridotomy and whatnot, um, also without regular screening and testing, uh, a person could essentially go blind from this by, or at least have significant visual problems before they even notice there are problems. And most of the problems are peripheral. I didn't even talk about this. Um, however, bef before we move on, uh, what happens when the optic nerve dies is, let's say like this is the entire field of vision. The, and we'll do this a different color here, we'll use green. So the, as nerve cells die, they die peripherally, so does the visual, um, the field of vision. So as these things are dying, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually people lose, more, and this is the only area where they can see, uh, they lose peripheral vision, you know, um, and it's something that they don't necessarily know. It's because it's so gradual, but what ends up happening is that people do visual field testing and then they'll notice that they have a super compromised visual field. And this actually is one of the number one reasons why people lose their driver's license because they can no longer see around their blind spots and whatnot. So it's actually something that's pretty significant for people in later stages of life who want to continue to drive. This could be a big problem. So anyways, long story short, silent thief of vision, it is something that can be quite significant to overall vision. And it's really unfortunate that most people um, not most people, lots of people get tested, but a lot of people don't get tested because they don't feel like anything's going wrong. This is yet again, another example of a good, um, you know, it's, it's advocacy for regular testing because this is something that you'll never notice on your own or your patients will never notice on their own, but can be caught early, treated and avoid any visual problems. So why is this important to us? Well, we've already talked about why, and let's just kind of go over again. Um, <clears throat> I want you to remember IOP isn't everything, okay? Uh, some people will have higher IOPs than other. So if you happen to see on someone's chart that they have, you know, intraocular pressure of 22 uh, units, you don't have to immediately assume, oh, this is a glaucoma patient. No, you know, maybe, you know, there's some people that just naturally have higher 
uh, intraocular pressures. So leave it to the doctors to decide whether or not this patient requires treatment or if, you know, can be deemed a glaucoma suspect or a glaucoma patient. Now, there's different approaches for different individuals, so you can't just assume that, oh, you have glaucoma, so you must be on this, this, and this, and you must have had an iridotomy, you must have had this. No, it, everything's different, and, you know, there are, there are ophthalmologists who are highly specialized in glaucoma. That's what they deal with every single day, and, and the world of ophthalmology is changing every day, so there are different techniques, there are different strategies, there are different treatments that are going to be utilized depending on the patient. So you can't always predict how these things are going to play out. However, it is cool for you to stay in the loop and understand what's going on and ask questions, especially ask questions, do research, understand what is going on, show some interest in, in these types of treatment uh, because you know, you're going to see a lot of different glaucoma patients. You'll see stents, you'll see things like that. It's really cool to be in the loop. Open angle versus closed angle, understand the difference. Open angle is a degenerative kind of condition, okay? Closed angle is an urgency, okay? Urgency. Now, you won't be treating the urgency. However, you have to understand why this is extremely important. Intraocular pressure that is completely pinched off because, sorry, if the angle is completely pinched off and intraocular pressure increases rapidly, uh, this could be extremely painful. It will be extremely detrimental to vision and it could lead to optic nerve death and blindness. So very, very important to be treated immediately. Okay, um, understand the concept of active treatment versus preventative measures. Okay, the big thing I want you to remember here is that just because preventative measures, if you see an iridotomy, okay, an IR, does not necessarily mean glaucoma. Stop, don't make that mistake, okay? It was probably just a preventative measure. And this person, you don't wanna, you don't wanna upset patients and scare them because, you know, now this, this is a debate that I've had before. Should the, you know, the amount of communication that takes on when procedures are made. Um, sometimes doctors don't wanna scare the patient and they'll just say, oh, we need to just do a little procedure here to prevent problems in the future, very common which is true and fine and actually maybe a good approach. However, they probably never mentioned the word glaucoma. Um, and actually there's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, they don't have glaucoma. We're just doing it to prevent glaucoma in the future. Um, especially we're preventing, you know, an acute issue where it is closed angle glaucoma. If the word glaucoma has never been used, you shouldn't be the first person to mutter it, right? So let's avoid making any kind of, you know, observations out loud. Um, in, in at risk of scaring a patient, okay? I wanted you to remember that. Um, and it, the game here is all about preventing optic nerve damage. The optic nerve, we've talked about it, it's critical in the visual process. If your optic nerve has, has problems, you will have problems. Um, and this is basically what we're doing is we're avoiding optic nerve damage and eventual peripheral vision loss, okay? You've got a bit of a handle on glaucoma. As a matter of fact, everything we talked about today, I think is actually more than what most um, optician courses and most literature will talk about. And it's very specific to what it affects, how it affects you. And that's it. You, you now understand how the mechanism behind both primary glaucomas, you understand a few treatment strategies that are utilized to prevent and treat. Um, and that's it. That's literally all it is. So, Let's stop it there and let's move on to the next.